organization. And uh, there's a couple of takeaways I want you to get from this. Uh, most people, when they think of Bayesian inversion, uh, of course, they think, oh, my gosh, I can add prior statistical stochastic priors to an inversion problem. And, and that is a really important aspect of Bayesian inversion. But uh, perhaps even more important is that it turns an inversion, which is usually uh, a matrix inversion, as we've seen on some previous uh, lessons, into a forward problem. So it, it says, okay, I can, I can take something where I've got some data and I want to get model parameters, and it says, well, you can also turn that around to an equivalent statistical sampling of a, of a distribution that is sampled through a forward problem. And the reason that that's really important is that if you have a really large multidimensional space, you can uh, more efficiently do the inversion problem. And uh, that also has a bunch of other advantages that we'll get to as we step through the presentation. But first, uh, a brief introduction to Bayes' theorem, uh, the, the sort of the engine or the core of this whole thing. Uh, so just take a look at this uh, diagram here, and let's say that we have some uh, model and data parameter space, and uh, we have a, a prior on the model that is this blue circle, and the probability of the data is, uh, is this red ellipse. So in general, in a statistical sense, our, our joint uh, or our inversion of this is, is a trying to find the joint probability between our model and our data. And in a conditional probability, that is just the probability of our data, this area, and then our model conditional on that. Well, you can also turn that around and uh, you can say, well, the equivalency is it's the probability of our model times the probability of uh, the data given the model. You can see that these two things are equal to one another. And if we set them equal to one another and divide through by probability of the data, that's Bayes' theorem. So it just says we've got the probability of the model given the data, our typical inverse problem, is equal to, to the probability of the, of the data given the model, this is our forward problem, times the probability of the model, this is our prior, and then uh, this probability of the data can be viewed as a, uh, as a normalization constant. Uh, the best, one of the easiest ways to look at this is uh, the application of uh, uh, Bayesian inversion to a grid search. And let's just say we took three points in this space and we said point one here that is in the probability in the model space but not the data we would say, well, what's my inverse? I've got the probability of the model given the data, Bayes' theorem, and if I evaluate that, it's uh, the probability of one over some constant, because I'm somewhere in this model space, times zero, because I'm not in my data space. So the probability of the inversion is zero here. Uh, likewise, if I go to my data space, I can evaluate this, and I get zero times zero, zero. But if I'm in this area of overlap, the probability of uh, of uh, the model given the data is one over some constant times one because I'm in both of these things. So I get, I get uh, the probability there is one over C. So, and it's easy to see that uh, the probability of uh, the model given the data is one over C for each point that lands in here. And C is just the number of points, the, the uh, density of the grid in this case, because that makes it all add up to one. So grid search is great, um, but it is, and it is an exhaustive approach, so you don't have to worry about uh, 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 not finding or getting stuck in local minima and things like that, but it's also computationally expensive, so uh, it's difficult to apply to multi-dimensional multi spaces. So that gets us to uh, inversion through sampling. Uh, so, and this is Markov chain Monte Carlo. So, our goal here is to draw samples from the probability density function, then infer the solution based on the sample density. And from that, you can say that the, the point with the highest density is our maximum likelihood point, which is our typical point inversion. And then the distribution or the uh, variation in density is our uncertainty. 
The advantage is it explores a large model space with fewer samples, much far, far fewer actually, and uh, the model space can be highly nonlinear and uh, potentially multimodal. So the difficulty is uh, how do you draw samples from a distribution you don't know? So you can look at this, this is our inversion. We actually don't know a priori what our inverse solution is. Uh, we may or may not know some model prior, so this could just be a flat prior. We don't know the uncertainty or the uh, probability of our data, uh, but what we do, can do is we can uh, evaluate the probability of the data given some configuration of the models, and we do that simply through, by looking at the, the residuals of the data given some configuration of the models. So. Let's start with what we can do. Uh, we can evaluate the ratio of data probability, data fit for two sets of model parameters. Let's say it's probability of the data given some model parameter configuration J and I. And as it turns out, that's all we need to know. If we have a target distribution of model parameters, uh, probability of the model in this case, and we have a distribution that describes the probability of transitioning from one set of model parameters to a new set of model parameters, that's this transition probability here, then in any subdomain A, we can integrate over that. And with a bunch of math that is listed here that I won't go through in detail, uh, we get the probability of the model in that sub area, which is exactly what we want to get. It's our, it's our inverse uh, solution, but there's a catch. And that catch is that this particular step in this derivation requires that this transition meet what's called the detailed balance condition. And this is the theoretical fundamental underpinning of MCMC and stochastic uh, inversion. And what it says is that uh, the transition has to meet this condition, which is the probability at my current position times the probability of transitioning from my current position to a new position has to equal the probability at my new condition, new position times the probability of uh, transitioning from the new position back to my current position. So there has to be this balance between going back and forth. So uh, just to, to start kind of recap, what does all this say? It says we can conditionally sample the probability of the model given the data, our inverse problem, with a model parameter transition kernel that satisfies the detailed balance condition. Uh, then the resulting Markov chain will sample from the stationary distribution of the model given the data, which is our inverse solutions. There are a number of transition kernels that meet this uh, detailed balance condition. Uh, the most popular, because it's very general, is Metropolis Hastings. I'll run through this uh, in uh, uh, just, just briefly. And it starts with a transition, uh, or the probability of uh, predicting a new point. So I'm predicting a new point M prime in model space. And it's just the conditional probability of uh, this new point I, in this case, is a, a new set of uh, model, model uh, parameters or a new point or a new uh, point in our Markov chain conditional on our current point and the data. And the first, the second step in this is to compute this acceptance ratio. And it's just the ratio of uh, the probability at our new proposed point times the probability of transitioning from from our old point to our new point divided by the probability at our new point or our old point and the times the probability or divided by the probability of uh, transitioning from our old point to our new point. And these things are evaluated through Bayes' theorem. So probability at uh, M prime of D is uh, just the probability of uh, the data at our new point uh, times the prior at that uh, new point divided by the data. And then same holds for our old point. Uh, this simplifies to just simply the ratios of these probabilities. And often this probability uh, uh, it, uh, of the transition kernel is uh, a Gaussian distribution or a random walk, so it just drops out. 
and uh, we're left with this, which is again just our ratio of the of the data at our new point times the prior at our old point divided by at our new point divided by the probability at our at our old point times the prior. So then what we do is we generate a random distribution between one and zero. If alpha, this, this probability is less than this uh, number that was randomly selected, then we accept our proposed point as a new point. Otherwise, we stay at our old point. So the probability of alpha can be greater than zero. The probability at our proposed point is, is uh, higher than our old point. Uh, and in that case, it's always accepted. And if the probability of the new point is less than it is accepted at a ratio that's uh, uh, at, a, at a probability that's the ratio of these two probabilities. This, this is uh, uh, perhaps a little bit uh, difficult to understand. So I'm going to step through an example here. Let's say we have our, our uh, old point and our new point, and this is our unknown probability of the model space. We propose uh, this new point, the probability is actually higher. So we would always accept this new point. So that means that if our transition kernel is this, the probability of transitioning from uh, our, our uh, current point to our new point, this is equal to one. So if I set this equal to one and then look at the transition kernel of, prob of transitioning from our old point to our new point, that's just the probability of transitioning from our, uh, from our existing point to our old point. So that means that this meets the detailed balance condition and that's why Metropolis Hastings works and it works by design. So returning to our cartoon version of this, uh, the way an MCMC -MC inversion would work is I'd start at some point, of course, I would start this point in a, in a place where our model prior is one, and I would just start randomly selecting uh, proposals. And I'd say I would go here, and uh, actually, since this is a probability of zero, I would reject it. Probability of zero, I would reject it. And at some point, I would randomly select a point up here in this space, and the probability would be higher so I would, uh, I would accept it, and then I would start proposing uh, new uh, points, and every time it stepped outside of this, it would be rejected, but all of the times it, it was, uh, the new point was in this region, I would accept it, and what you get is an even distribution of points in this area, and that would be my stochastic or MCMC -MC inversion to the inverse problem. There's more to MCMC -MC than uh, uh, just Metropolis Hastings, but uh, the advantage of Metropolis Hastings is that we don't need to know the analytical form of this probability. The disadvantage is that Metropolis Hastings can be inefficient if it's not well tuned. Uh, so this case is what if we, what if the proposal step is too large? Uh, yeah, and then new proposals will tend to be on the tails of this distribution and therefore have a very low probability of being accepted. And you can see this, I, I, uh, this is actually from Bayslope that you'll see later, and I intentionally step, set the step size to be way too big for this. And in this case, I've just got one parameter, which is the latitude of an event, and this is iteration from 500 to 2,000. And what you can see here is that uh, this gets, starts at some point, it, uh, it marches along, all the samples are rejected until it gets to a new point, all the samples are rejected until it gets to here, and it very slowly samples this space. Now, if we continue uh, these iterations to infinity, it would still work, but uh, the the uh, idea here is to sample this distribution with as few points as possible. So uh, Metropolis Hastings has some implementation uh, uh, issues, or not issues, but there's some tricks to try to sample things more efficiently, but I'll get to that in a minute. So if but there's we another... Have, we yeah. have two questions, if you don't mind. Go ahead. 
So the first question is, how do we know we are close enough to the correct parameter region so that you reach them eventually? So if you look at a st stochastic sampling, given some current uh, uh, distribution, then you, if you, if you were to make an infinite number of samples, you'll eventually hit the area in the probability distribution space where the solution is. Uh, we have the advantage that typically these probability spaces are not flat in areas outside of our, our solution, just like for a linear inversion. So you tend to climb the probability space hill and get local to where you want to be, and then MCMC starts to sample in that region. Um, and, and again, I've got, a, I've got a movie of this that might make that clearer. Uh, I hope that answers the question. It did, and then we have a second question. The question is, is there a version of backtracking for MCMC to find the optimal set size? It's usually done through trial and error. Uh, and th that gets to some of the tricks. And what that, uh, I wasn't going to cover this, but what you do is by trial and error, you start to look at the step size that achieves an optimal acceptance ratio. So you're always looking at uh, making it bigger uh, or making it smaller. If, you, if every, if every uh, iteration is accepted, you tend to try to make that, uh, that uh, proposal step bigger. And if you're getting a bunch of steps that are being rejected, then your, your algorithms should try to make that smaller. But that gets into kind of the details of uh, algorithm development. Um, any other questions? No, I think we're okay. Okay. So, uh, again, the power of uh, Metropolis Hastings is we don't know, we don't need to know this distribution. Uh, but there are some cases where we might have some idea or know an analytical form to this distribution. And uh, we can sample it directly. And it's, uh, that's also an MCMC iteration. And that's exactly what this Gibbs sampling does. And Gibbs sampling, as, as you'll see in a minute, should always be used if you can. Uh, so it says, if the probability of one parameter conditional on all others takes a, an analytical form, then samples updates uh, uh, one model parameter at a time while holding the others constant. And you can see that in this, uh, in this uh, conditional probability. What we're saying is, that the next step in, in uh, sampling this particular model parameter, we just choose it conditional on all of our other model parameters up to this J, uh, and then conditional on all the other model parameters that uh, I've already updated, uh, and conditional on the data. Now, this sounds a little like magic, but there's this great paper that shows that if I sequentially update these things, uh, then it does draw from the uh, uh, joint probability distribution of all of the model parameters. Uh, there's a number of Gibbs samplers that work. Uh, a common Gibbs statistical model and the one that's used in Bayes loc is that we assume that a subset of the parameters, and when I say a subset, you can think of that as, uh, and what, you know, what we actually do is uh, we have to sample the latitude, longitude, and depth with a uh, Metropolis Hastings, but we can sample the origin times with a Gibbs sampler uh, because the residuals or the changes in them all form this uh, distribution. So we say that uh, the distribution of uh, model parameter J is Gaussian with some uh, mean and variance, but then here's the trick. We say that uh, the distribution of all of these means is zero with some variance. And we also say that uh, uh, the variance of the set of model parameters is distributed like a gamma distribution. And a gamma distribution is always positive. It usually starts at zero and ramps up to some value and then down again. And if we can, 
if we can make this assumption, then there's an analytical solution to how we update this, and this is it. And I won't go into this in detail, but it, uh, the, the mean of this new model update has to do with uh, this, this uh, distribution on the variances of the set of model parameters. It has to do with the variance on the means. It has this data term, so the data also drive it, and then the variance is set by these other parameters as well. And the, the variance on this new model parameter, likewise, is uh, based on these parameters that we can also update and the data. So then we just draw a random sample from this updated uh, estimation of the mean, the updated estimation of the uh, variance, and draw a random sample from that, and we get the update to this model parameter. And Gibbs sample is super efficient because the sample is always accepted. So, and that is the reason that you always want to use Gibbs sampling as opposed to MCMC, is that if you can, if you can make this assumption uh, of, of, uh, of the parameters being Gaussian and all these other assumptions, then the analytical solution will give you an answer. So that is the background section on, uh, on Bayesian inversion and MCMC. And now I'm going to shift gears to uh, Bayesloc. And this is the implementation of this method to a multiple event uh, seismic location method. Uh, so like every other seismic location method, uh, at its core, all we're trying to do is find the, uh, or minimize the difference between predicted and, uh, and observed arrivals. And that's shown here in uh, this schematic where I've got a test location in green and the actual location in red. This is a nuclear explosion at the former Soviet Union uh, test site at Novaya Zemla in, uh, in Russia. And if I look at the aligned waveforms, and I look at this hypothesized location, I get these green travel time predictions that don't fit very well. So the event is clearly not there. But even if I look at the known location, the red here and these waveforms are aligned on that, some of these have very small residuals. Others, it's actually quite sizable. Uh, so this one's early, this one's late. Uh, in this case, uh, measurement there isn't too much of an issue. But it's important to note that even when we're at the exact location of the event, there's still errors here because the travel time predictions are inaccurate. So uh, keep that in mind as you, uh, as you, as we go forward. So the Bayes Loc uh, models, uh, the multiple event systems, we have event locations and origin times. We have uh, travel time predictions, which may suffer from regional travel time bias or path specific error due to structure in the earth. Uh, the arrival time measurements might be uh, precise or imprecise. In this case, you'll see uh, in statistics, precision has a distinct definition, with, which is one over the variance. And uh, always uh, remember that uh, the arrival time phase assignments could be in error. Sometimes you call a phase PG when it's actually PN, for instance, and I'll show you some examples of that. So we want to model this whole system, and this gets into this huge multidimensional space that I mentioned uh, that, that we want to solve, and this can get arbitrarily large depending on how many events you want to determine. So we would like to know uh, the event locations, uh, travel time corrections, and measurement precisions uh, based on just a few things, uh, and that is the arrival time data. And, and in a statistical model, that means that we want the probability of the origin times, X, the event locations. We want to know the uh, phase travel times. We want to know the true phase labels. We want to assess the precision of, uh, of these uh, measurements. We want to know the precision of the travel time model. And we want all this based on our input data. So that's asking an awful lot. And uh, if you just threw this into a naively formulated system, you'd find that you can't solve this. So formulation of that problem is key. So using 
Bayes uh, theorem, we can take this big ugly mess and uh, we can divide it into a number of forward problems. So the most fundamental one is this first one where we say given our event origin times, our travel times implicit in this is the event location, our phase labels and the uncertainty on those, we can calculate the probability of our arrivals. Uh, but then we can chain together these other forward problems. And that is the probability of the true travel times given my model, uh, predicted travel times and their corrections. And then we also have the probability of the phase labels given what the analysts gave us or given what was measured and the probability of, uh, of uh, our priors, essentially. These are our event location or hypocenter priors. We can have priors on, for instance, what our measurement precisions were and priors on the travel time corrections. And then here's this, uh, always this nuisance event of probability of the arrivals themselves, which we saw drops out in our MCMC inversion. So this gets to some of the uh, uh, formulation of the problem to help us uh, make this actually tractable. And what this says is that our variance for any given uh, station, event, and phase, uh, if we take the inverse of that, that's a precision. And we're going to model this as a multiplication of uh, all that's based on a fit to all of the data for that phase all of the uh, arrivals for that event and all of the arrivals at that particular station. And what this does is the product of precisions tends to downweight components with large variance. And this is important because uh, this just shows a, a case where I say, I have P waves, they tend to have pretty small uncertainty. So this is the equivalent distribution of that. I have an event that's okay, this station tends to be poor. Uh, I use this formulation and I get an uncertainty that is uh, it's actually not too bad based on, based on my data. So uh, the important thing here is that the phase arrivals, this thing that's most precisely determined drives this system. And then I have modifications to it based on the event and the station. The travel time formulation or the travel time correction is uh, one of the key components of phase load. And it says that at each iteration of my MCMC, the travel time of my uh, event station and phase is my model travel time plus a static correction to that plus a correction based on the event station distance. And then I can add various uh, adjustment parameters to that that are based on uh, that are based on the station, the station and the phase, and potentially even on the event, although I almost never use this one. And physically what this is, if I have a model uh, travel time curve, distance versus travel time, uh, this first parameter is a potential shift up. So you can think of that as say, my crust is too thick uh, or it's thicker than the model and that causes uh, PN to be late everywhere because the event's gotta go down to the moho and over. So we try to find that shift. Uh, our phase might be too slow. Uh, this parameter corrects for that. So the, the slope of the travel time curve is corrected. And then I might have statistical variations about this curve for each individual station. And that's what these parameters uh, try to correct. Uh, this Before is, you this, move on, we have yeah, one more yeah. question. Uh, sure. So the question is, can you clarify the phase value? Uh, is it a designation? Um, the, uh, the phase value. Do uh, you mean the phase label name? Uh, the W part of the phase value. W part of the phase value. So W is, uh, let's, uh, let's take a look. Yeah, actually, I can do it here. So I think that what you're talking about is this, uh, the capital W, and I'm sorry, I wasn't terribly clear about this. The capital W is our estimate of the true set of phase labels. And the lowercase W 
is our what was input or given to us as the set of phase labels. It, it, does that answer the question? I believe it <clears throat> does. I can't see the comments, so I'm right. Uh, oh, so there's a follow up. I think the question kind of refers to like, like, is there a, a number associated with with this or is it like a like is it discrete or kind of a like how, how does that um how's it yeah is it a label oh, like see. it's a pn phase or is it an actual time it's a p it, it is the pn phase and the way that you can think about this and what you'll see later is that any in any given iteration of the base low conversion I have assigned that particular arrival a phase label and through MCMC I will test through iterations whether other phase labels or whether it's uh, it's an outlier I'll test whether that improves the probability of the whole system so I what and the, the the important thing here is that unlike other locators Bayes loc never just says I can't use this datum throw it away or I've reassigned this and now I've got to keep it. Throughout the entire MCMC chain, it's testing what combinations of phase labels work best to maximize probability. And again, you'll see later that when I, and the way you analyze that is that you look at the probability of number of occurrences where that phase label was used. And that is your posteriori probability that that phase label is correct. I'm getting ahead of myself, but uh, does that answer the question? Okay, I'm going to assume that it does because I'm not. Oh, okay. so one more so clarification other, before we move on. Um, yeah. So, is the travel time to use to discriminate these phase labels? In this case, it is the uh, both the travel times. But also importantly, it's that assessment of what my expected uncertainty is, this here. So let's say that I had a distribution that was really wide and I had large uncertainties. Uh, essentially that says, I, I don't know whether that is uh, an outlier or not. But if I have a distribution that's tight and I have a, a residual that's way out here on the tails, uh, then the probability that that's an outlier is much higher. So it depends on the datum specific uncertainty that's assessed for that particular arrival. Okay. Yes, great, thank you. So getting to phase labels, um, this is a real case and uh, identified this because I ran base loc and uh, uh, it identified this particular arrival as an outlier. So I decided to go back and look at it. And this is predicted uh, time relative to the predicted P time. Uh, these are, again, real uh, picks from the USGS uh, EDR bulletin. And you can see that at this, uh, there wasn't a pick at this particular station, but at this one, the analyst picked this little bump out here that, uh, you know, it's a very honest, uh, understandable mistake. And then they picked this as the depth phase. Uh, the, these other waveforms are here for context. And then for this one, they picked uh, this as P and this as little p, big P. Uh, through this MCMC sampling, uh, Bayes Loc identified that this was uh, an outlier or junk. And, it's, and it relabeled this little p, big P as P. They also kept this P and relabeled uh, this little p big p as little s big p. So it's likely that that's little p big p right there. So that's the kind of error that we're trying to correct because these errors in phase labels absolutely uh, kill an event location. If you have a particular station or datum that is key in the solution, this kind of error can throw off your solution by tens, even hundreds of kilometers. And then, of course, we have priors. Uh, and uh, I suggest that you use these judiciously uh, because if you place a prior or if you enforce a prior that turns out to be wrong, then your whole solution is wrong. 
And this is the knock against Bayesian solutions or Bayesian inversion is that perhaps these priors are overused. But in some cases, you might say, I've got an event. This is a satellite image of a mine. And you say, I know this event is at this mine. I just don't know where in the mine it is. You could put a stochastic prior and say, I know it occurred at the mine. And then it will take that into consideration in the inversion. Uh, travel times for a particular region, you might say, uh, you know, I, I know that my travel time uh, model is good to within some uh, uncertainty. I can, uh, I can put that uh, prior on that and then pick uncertainty. I can say, you know, some picks are better than others and you can put priors on that too. So how does Bayes-Loc uh, do this? I went through Metropolis Hastings. I went through Gibbs. I didn't cover Slice uh, because of time, but uh, essentially we progressively step through this. We propose new locations based on Metropolis Hastings, update the origin time with Gibbs, update the travel time correction with Gibbs, update the phase label with Gibbs, and then we update this, uh, this measurement error with a combination of Gibbs and Slice. And this Slice is used to look at the overall population of uh, measurement uncertainty. And again, I'm going to gloss over that, but uh, all of this is covered in the papers that, uh, that uh, can be referenced for this. And we just do this over and over and over again. Uh, this is a movie we put together a while ago to visualize the MCMC inversion here. Uh, this is a set of nuclear explosions at the uh, Nevada test site. And the known locations are these triangles here, and the starting locations are these points here. And this is travel time as a function of distance, or travel time residual as a function of distance. This is minus 10 to 10 for PN, PG, and LG. And I'll just run this, and, uh, and I'll step through it again, but I want you to just look at it and see what it does. Oops. Okay, so having looked at that, let's step through what this is doing. Every one of these points, I start iterating, and so the iteration number is up here. This is iteration number 24, so early on, I usually run this for about 10,000 iterations. It is just trying to find the local neighborhood of where these things actually occur and it is slowly converging to uh, where the events occur. At this point, uh, the phase labels are on. I'm, I'm trying to throw away or re, re, uh, reassign phase labels that don't fit. Travel time corrections are off, and the uh, arrival time uncertainty estimates are off too. And all I'm trying to do is find the local neighborhood of where these things are and after about 500 iterations, I'm in the neighborhood. Uh, and then you'll see that travel time corrections turn on, the arrival time uh, measurement uncertainty. So trying to fit that datum specific uncertainty or determine what it is is turned on. And it starts to march around the uh, uncertainty or the actual known point uh, of all of these things that you see here. Now, you see that the distributions on these uh, residuals get smaller, and these X's are cases where at that iteration, it's saying that is an outlier. It's not used. And in this case, this particular phase has been reassigned as PG. And you might say, well, the residual here is bigger than this one. Why is this one an outlier? And this gets back to that point where, well, the distribution, the, the estimate of the uncertainty for this point was fairly large, so I couldn't call it an outlier, whereas my expected residual for this was really small, and, uh, and it would, but it ended up being at the edges of that distribution. So then you just march through this thing. Uh, this only shows a thousand iterations, but you keep going for another 9,000 iterations, and those samples form your posteriori solutions. Hey, Steve, we have a, a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, the first is, is there a standard for how many iterations generally should be done? Um, let me postpone that uh, question because I have uh, 
a, a slide that kind of gets to what does convergence mean. So can, if there's another question, let's go to that, but let me postpone that one. Okay, the second question is, can you say something about whether you are using a lattice or non-lattice walk and why? I, I think that uh, uh, I interpret that as meaning uh, a lattice like uh, am, I, am I looking at a pseudo grid search space and then uh, looking at uh, the probability of moving from one point in the grid space to another. And, in, and Bayslope does not do that. And, uh, and probably the main reason, and that's, that's uh, if you look at like neighborhood algorithms and things like that, that's what that is. And the main reason is that uh, we find we don't need to, and it's just simple or not to. Okay, and we Any have other questions? a third one, um, which is, is Bayeslog only, can you only use it for seismic arrivals or can you also include um, hydroacoustic T phases um, and or infrasound arrivals? You can use it for anything, any phase for which you have a travel time uh, estimate. So uh, this version does not have uh, azimuth. I have a version that has uh, phase azimuth, uh, but that is not one of the publicly released versions of the code at this time. Uh, so infrasound, I have used this for infrasound. And uh, all I need is uh, uh, an estimated arrival time based on celerity or a more complicated model, and it will accept it. And same with hydroacoustic. And then we have another Any question. Questions? Yeah, so it says some papers doing Bayesian in version mentioned that they had to achieve a very specific acceptance rate for their parameters, like 20% or 40%, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Is this only about making the algorithm more efficient or is there any reason for this specific, uh, these specific values of the acceptance? So I would direct that question to uh, some, uh, some of the textbooks on MCMC inversion, and particular the ones by uh, Gemin and Gemin, and and that's that same uh, that same group, the guy, the 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 group that uh, uh, proved that uh, uh, Gibbs sampling converges. They have all kinds of information on that, and they have some theoretical basis for why an acceptance ratio of about a third is optimal. Uh, so. Uh, if, it, if, the, if the step size is too small, you'll tend to accept, but that means that each step in the MCMC chain is correlated with the other. And again, that gets to this issue of mixing for which I have a slide and I deferred that previous question. So you might, you, you'll see that again in, in just a second. Uh, any other questions? Uh, that's that's it for now. Thanks. Okay. So I'm going to run through this fairly fast. Uh, this is a movie showing the Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, samples for the travel time corrections. So you're going to see, even though this is a multiple event case, I'm showing the latitude and longitude of just one event. And, uh, and then you'll see the uh, travel time correction here, and you'll see the residuals, and these lines are the are the uncertainties uh, of a particular residual. So you see this thing marching around. Uh, all of a sudden, the uh, travel time, uh, uh, well, the, the estimate of the precision will turn on. And all of a sudden, you see that uh, the residuals get fairly small as I'm marching around here. Uh, but you can see that a trend starts to develop in this travel time residual. And that means that it can't fit the data fairly well, so the uncertainties have to be large. And then I turn on this travel time correction model that changes the slope and the intercept of the travel time curve, and I start to fit the data a lot better. And this is based on uh, all the events, all the stations, so it's not just one direction. So you get a regional unbiased estimate of what the actual travel time curve should be. So what do you get out of this? Uh, what you don't get is the traditional point 
and then some uncertainty ellipse. You get a bunch of samples, and then you have to do something, you have to analyze that. Uh, and what you can do, probably one of the best ways to look at that, is a heat map of the density of points. And in this case, this is uh, easting uh, longitude, northing latitude, and you can look at that, uh, that heat map. Uh, the actual location of this thing is at zero, zero, so it's here. So one of these modes of the distribution uh, actually fits the data pretty well, and the other one doesn't. And this mode off here to the west is the actual analyst input data. And all these red points are comprised of phase arrivals at station MNV and LAC that are, as the analyst predicted, all the blue ones, it says that this PN is junk, and, uh, and then all the other ones are kept constant. And the green ones, it says that uh, PN is junk and uh, uh, PN for LAC is junk, but it renames this PG to PN. So that gives this. And my overall posteri posteriori or probability is the collection of, or the marginal probability is the collection of all of these points. Now, if we uh, knew, if the data set was able to unambiguously determine that all of these were wrong, then I would get this mode, but this data set just doesn't allow us to do it. But you do get this uh, much more representative solution. Uh, that can be uh, a good way for an event that you're really interested in and you want to know the answer. I, I, I always look at solutions in, in this way, but that's not something you want to do with when you have thousands of events. Uh, the other thing you can do is assume, and this is now a latitude, longitude, depth, so this is a three-dimensional estimate of all these points. I can then assume that this distribution is drawn from a Gaussian, uh, and I can then fit uh, an ellipse or an, an ellipsoid to it, and that can be my uh, output representation, which is a, can be represented as a point and then semi-major axes of this, uh, of this ellipse. And, Base loc outputs the information that you need to compute this. It outputs the uncertainties and covariances of these parameters. There's a caveat. Uh, this is a real case. This is depth as a function of, uh, of latitude or longitude in this case. And you see this very nonlinear kind of behavior. So if I was really interested in where this point actually was, I'd look at the, these samples and say, wow, this thing could be any number of points. But if I assumed this was Gaussian, I would get this uh, Zeppelin-looking balloon that is way, it's not very representative of this distribution at all because it's not Gaussian. So you do have to be careful. Now I'm going to get to this uh, chain mixing issue. Uh, we're running late on time, so I'm going to run through this fairly quickly. But the uh, uh, Markov chain represents the distribution when it is well mixed. Uh, and this is a one of these statistical MCMC terms. Well mixed means that the chain has reached a steady state. And the way I always think of this is, uh, would a subsample give me approximately the same answer as the whole chain? And this is just one of these cases where I'm looking at 60,000 iterations. And I had to take that many samples because in this portion of the Markov chain, uh, the distributions were changing all the time. It was, it was not well mixed, not stationary, and it finally reached this point where beyond there, I get the same answer going forward. So I have to throw away these, these samples and I can keep these ones. So getting back to that previous question, how do you know it's converged? How do you, you, you're always looking to see whether or not the uh, distribution is stationary uh, for a long uh, period of, uh, uh, a long number of iterations. The other thing is, uh, uh, this gets back to a, a previous example I showed. This particular one is not well mixed ever. This is a bad solution. And when I review MCMC papers, I always ask the, ask the authors to show me things like this because I see so many papers where they just said, oh, I did sampling and here's my solution. And I see things like this and I say, that's not a solution at all because uh, you, your, your distribution is not well mixed. Your, your samples are not representative because if I took any subset of these samples 
it wouldn't represent the overall uh, distribution that I'd get if I looked at all of them. So I'd have to run this longer or have a more efficient sampler. So we have Again, two I'll, questions. Yep. Yep. So the first is, can the travel time correction handle large velocity contrast, for example, contrast in the apparent velocity of a given phase at greater offset? I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, maybe somebody can help me with that. Sure, maybe um, we have a second question, so let's move on to the second and maybe the person that asked the question can provide a little bit more context in the chat. Yeah. So the second question is, is the covariance defined only for the three spatial parameters? Uh, so the output of Bayes loc only gives you the covariance and the covariance is only defined for Gaussian distributions. So it's a construct in this case because the output MCMC samples are non-parametric. Uh, but the output uh, covariance is only given for the hypocenter parameters. And then, but you can, you can determine them yourself by outputting all the samples of two parameters and then calculating their, their empirical covariance. Uh, should we circle back to that first question? Do we get any clarification on that? Not yet. Okay. Maybe you could repeat it because I maybe I, maybe I missed something. Sure. Oh, okay. Okay. So here we go. So the um, they ha have a glacier seismic data set with a low velocity layer ice overlaying a high velocity layer limestone, and the P phase move out kinks once it becomes a head wave. So the question is, can the travel time correction handle a contrast like that? So uh, this is a trick in Bayes' loc. Uh, I call those two things different phases. So if I have a, uh, a portion of a travel time curve that has some linear behavior, say it's the travel through ice, and then I have another that is where it's really pretty much traveling through rock, uh, I just say the one through ice is one phase and the one through rock is another phase. And that way I break the travel time correction for those two things. And uh, it allows the slope for, for one to be appropriate, uh, for each of them to be appropriate. Now you can just link them together, but it's possible that uh, you will not get an optimal travel time correction. Now, if, if, you, if all you're dealing with is a delay due to the ice for, uh, for travel times at greater distance, base local handle, that's fine. If you have some ground truth to, that it can tie that to. Okay. okay, and then we have one, yes. Uh, we have one final question. Uh, so the final question is, would you remind, would you recommend, uh, so the, if you have posteriors that are still non-Gaussian, um, oh, I, I apologize. What would you recommend if posteriors are still non-Gaussian even after removing the burn-in period? Uh, what that means is that your solution is non-Gaussian and uh, you can choose to deal with that. Well, the way I do it is if I'm writing a paper or something, I report this, I, I show this figure and I say, this is a very non-Gaussian uh, solution. The event may be over here or it may be over here and I don't know. Uh, if I'm outputting uh, a bulletin, I tend to summarize them in this, you know, Gaussian form because it's just too complicated to represent these non-Gaussian forms in a compact way. Or it's, I, I haven't figured out a good way to do it. Other questions? Okay. I think we're good. Okay. So I'm I'm wrapping up. I just want to show some cases where we've applied this. 
Uh, in one case, in a 2011 JGR paper, uh, this is some papers with Nathan Simmons, I located all this global seismicity. These are mislocation vectors, so it's not that they moved. You know, this is North America. Things didn't move hundreds of kilometers, but each one of these, this is, represents 20 kilometers. We saw all kinds of interesting biases where subduction zone events moved uh, very systematically. Uh, but we also looked at the tomographic images that resulted from this. And this is image roughness versus RMS misfit. And the way you typically do this is that you would take a bunch of single event locations. I determine an optimal point on my tomographic trade-off between roughness and residuals. I would then use the new model, relocate, and do that again. And I would get a new curve. And in this case, when we do this with the multiple event relocations, we get this uh, blue curve here where the, and I should say that as, as you iterate, this thing immediately falls into a local minimum and it doesn't change after two iterations. When we use the multiple event locations that appear to be less biased, we get a smoother model and it fits the data a lot better. And this is an example of a cross section through Central America where the subduction zone of the Central American uh, slab uh, is continuous. You can see that there's not a lot of chatter in this. Uh, but if we do this approach, uh, single event iterative uh, tomography and relocation, we get this uh, kind of uh, image where, uh, yeah, you can see that there's a subduction zone there, but uh, you may have a false interpretation that this is discontinuous. The other thing I've done is uh, used priors. This case is a more recent uh, reassessment of the locations at the North Korean test site. We used INSAR to model uh, the displacement field of one of the events. Uh, that displacement field is shown in red here, and this is topography on a, on a map. And then we use finite element modeling to uh, reproduce that displacement field and found that the optimal point because of the topography is actually offset from the peak in displacement. And then we use that as a prior. This is this 2016 January event that we think the, the epicenter is here, even though it's actually in the mountain down here. And we use that as a prior constraint to locate all of the other nuclear tests at the test site and got results uh, like this that are uh, the relative pattern is similar to other efforts. But in this case, uh, we've tied it to an absolute reference frame, which other people have only guessed at. They appear to have guessed right, but in this case, it's based on, it's based more on data. So in summary, Bayesian inversion, um, A, it enables probabilistic constraints on model parameters. It lends itself to these stochastic solvers. It's good for high dimensional spaces. Uh, it's good also for nonlinear inversions, as we've seen, multimodal and whatnot. The output is non-parametric, which can be a plus and it can be a minus. It just, uh, it, it depends. Uh, some of the caveats, it's, uh, it's uh, better for computationally cheap forward problems. You wouldn't want to be uh, running SpecFem 3D uh, thousands of times to get an MCMC solution. Uh, uh, but it's okay for travel time because it takes microseconds to compute a travel time. <clears throat> Theoretically, it represents the joint probability density when the number of samples is infinite. We never get infinite number of samples, but it's a very good approximation when the chain is well mixed, and we covered that mixing a little bit. So that's the end of the presentation portion, and uh, are there any additional questions? Let's give it a moment to see if anyone wants to type their questions in really quickly. Okay, I think uh, we don't have any questions at this moment, so I'm going to stop recording.